Hey everyone, my name is Cora and we're so glad that you're taking the time out of your schedule to check out our services from this past weekend. If you'd like to know more about Christian Life, feel free to check us out at www.christian.life. You can also download our free app for your Apple or Android devices. Is your life a mess while it seems like everyone else's life is perfect? Especially those people talking about their perfect kids and their perfect homes with their perfect dogs? Well, guess what? The church is full of imperfect people just like you. Join us for a five-week series called My Imperfect Life as we get authentic with the real truth of our pain, heartbreak, and regrets. We hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning. Welcome to church. If you're visiting with us in-house or online, we are delighted that you chose to worship with us today. You picked a great week to come out because you haven't missed a thing. We're starting a brand new series called My Imperfect Life. I love that intro video, right? Because you take the narrow view of someone's life and it looks like they have it all together, but as you spread out a little bit, back away a little bit, you begin to see, come on, there's some mess, right? We all have some imperfections, and that's what we're talking to you about this morning. We all have areas in our life where we just don't seem to have it all together. So if you are visiting with us this morning, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. And so it took me a couple of years to figure this out when I started coming to Christian Life 21 years ago. And I sincerely just didn't know. And so I'm going to tell you right off the bat, and uh, I probably will never talk about this again. It's something we try to hide. Um, But this morning you're going to hear it. Today and today only, are you ready? And so if you walked in and you said, wow, these guys like have it all together, the secret is we don't. And you laugh, but I came here for about two years and I thought we did because we lived in Muhammad. And so we came here on Sunday morning, and on Sunday morning, man, you guys look good. Come on, high five your neighbor, tell him you look good. (laughs) High five your other neighbor, tell him you don't look too bad neither. (laughs) But we look good on Sunday morning, and so I came in from Muhammad church on Sunday, and I remember I worked with people, and they talked about like church splits that one of them was going through and the pastor had an affair and just all this stuff and I'm like man you guys are jacked up you need to come to Christian life because these guys we got it together (laughs) honest honest this is the way it went down and then what happened is I moved here and so I lived in Rantoul and so I started hanging out with you all and I found out you guys got issues (laughs) come on help me help me with this last part if you don't think you have issues you have issues that's your issue Right? And so we got problems, but, but we try to hide it. That's just kind of the nature of, of human beings. And so I don't know if you got a chance to watch the NFL draft. Um, I didn't watch it because the Bears only had a couple picks, and really there was nothing else that mattered other than what the Bears were doing. And so anyways, I started getting these mixed reports, right? The Bears did great. The Bears stunk it up. And I'm like, what's going on? And so I, I went in online and I looked at the clips of the players that we drafted. And I'm watching. I'm like, these guys are awesome. All four of them just making these incredible plays. I'm like, why are people complaining? And then I go and I read the scouting reports. Now the scouting reports gives you the good, bad, and the ugly. And so it had a lot of good things to say. But in one of them in particular, it said, well, he's, he's a guy who doesn't play every down. What, what that means is he doesn't give his best effort every down. So like defensive backs on first down sometimes take it easy because they figure it's going to be a running play, and well, coaches don't like that. And so the other thing it said is that he had some character issues early in his career, his college career. And so these are the kind of things you see that doesn't show up on the highlight clip. The highlight clip doesn't show the plays when he's dogging. It doesn't show him fighting with his teammates at practice. It just shows the best of, listen, Sunday morning, this is the best of who we are. Come on, we're pulling up and our cars are washed and the, the kids are smiling and mom and dad are holding hands, but maybe what you didn't see was that knockdown drag out before they left for church. Come on, mom was crying, kids were crying, dog was crying. Right, we don't know, we, we don't know. 
But we do know that we live in an imperfect world. What we like to say around here is we are an imperfect church filled with imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. I say we like to say that. I made that up this week. (laughs) But that's the way I see it. We are an imperfect church filled with imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. In this world, man, there is problems. There are issues. There is imperfection. There is wars and genocide and pestilence and disease and famine and sickness and death. And we can go on and on and on. Acts of war. Uh, uh, acts of war. Acts of God. You ever hear that? They call that now the natural disasters, acts of God. I, I had an insurance agent. My, my pool collapsed about six, seven years ago. 35 mile per hour winds and it buckled the side of my pool. The whole thing collapsed and I went to collect insurance and he says, sorry, we don't cover that. It's an act of God. You ever notice how quick we are to blame God for our problems? And, and I'm like, you know what? Okay, I can get over religious too. Well, this morning I was praying and God said, you're to pay for it, right? I mean, two could play that game, but whatever. We got these issues because our world is not perfect and the Bible gives an explanation for why that is. And so I want to open up the Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 3, first book of the Bible. And so I want to give you, before I read the first 19 verses of Genesis 3, I I want to tell you where this all began. In in Genesis 1, God spoke the world into creation, and he began to create things. He created human beings. He created the man, and then out of the man, he created the woman. And they had this wonderful environment. It was a perfect environment. Sin had not yet entered. And it says that they walked with God in the cool of the day. We can't even imagine what that would be like to be face to face with the God of the universe. Who knows what that was like, but it must have been wonderful. And then, man, it didn't take us very long. We screwed the whole thing up. And here it is, the account of it in Genesis chapter 3. I'll, for the most part, just read through this, and then we'll talk about the consequences of the fall of man. Verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. And the woman, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from his fruit and ate, and she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called the man and said to him, where are you? And just for the record, when God asks questions, he's not looking for information. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me. From the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are all, are you more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head. And you shall bruise him on the heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Thanks, Eve. (laughs) In pain you will bring forth children. Let your, your, yet your husband will be, yet your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. And then he said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your face you will eat your bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. And for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You know, there would be no possible way 
I can even exaggerate the consequences as a result of the fall of man. This began the rebellion that's in our hearts against God. The curse began as a result of rejecting God's authority. And so in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, the first person born in the natural way was a man by the name of Cain, and he murdered his brother, Abel. When God asked him where his brother was, instead of remorse, he responds with sarcasm. Am I my brother's keeper? Can you imagine the audacity? I, I, I mean, he's copping a tune with God. And so children naturally oppose authority. Come on, among the very first word that's ba- words that babies learn is always no, right? Or mine. It's the selfishness. It's our nature now. Can I tell you, adults don't like authority all that much neither, do we? I, I heard a pastor once say, he said, I like authority when I am the authority. I like authority when authority supports my decisions. He went on to say, I I, I like to have the opportunity to call the police. I just don't like being chased by the police. Right? Isn't that about how it is for us? This rejection of authority is part of our inherited rebellious nature. And then there was the innocence that was lost. Adam and Eve, they were naked. If you're watching online from the south, you say naked. But they didn't have clothes on. It says they weren't ashamed. How many of you know small children, they have no shame with their bodies? They don't mind you taking the pictures in the bathtub. Just when they grow up, they don't want you showing it to anybody. (laughs) Right? But there was that kind of innocence with with Adam and Eve, and they were adults. They had no self-consciousness. It wasn't until later later that Eve asked, does this fig leaf make me look fat? (laughs) And Adam was probably naive enough to answer the question. But Cain killed Abel out of jealousy. Right? Jealousy wasn't even a thing before the fall. Murder would have never even entered his heart. The thought would have never even come to him, but we lost our innocence. There was no inclination towards sin before the fall. We were truly innocent. We can't even comprehend what that would be like today. And then there's the guilt and shame. They, they sinned and then they hid from God. Can I tell you that's still our natural response? We mess up and we hide from God. I can tell a person's spiritual maturity by how quickly they rebound from that. When you mess up, instead of turning and hiding from God, you just go into your father's loving arms because you know that he loves you, irrelevant of of, of the way you live your life. And we're quick to repent and we're quickly to embrace him. But because of guilt and shame, come on, we have a hard time even today taking responsibility for our own actions. And so we do what they did. We begin to point fingers right? And, and so Adam blamed Eve. And then if you, if you caught that, he blamed God. This woman that, by the way, you gave me, and then she blamed the serpent, but nobody's taken responsibility. And then there's the curse of the earth, the land, land no longer produced effortlessly. And now hard manual labor would be required to simply produce food. And we see things like hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions, and so forth. Can I tell you the biggest curse on the earth, as far as I'm concerned, is winter. For real. It snowed in Chicago yesterday. There was no winter in the garden. How do you know? Because they were naked and not ashamed. Means it was tropical. Come on, you ever heard of a nudist colony in Siberia? I'm just saying, Adam wasn't shoveling snow in the garden. There wasn't such a thing. And now we have disease and sickness and death. But come on, church, that wasn't God's original plan. This was all a diversion because of the decisions we made, and we go on and on and on. We could talk about the depravity of man and so on and so forth. Things just don't work the way that they're supposed to work, and it's our fault. And that's all part of our inheritance in Adam. But here's the good news. This is what I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about, it is that for those of us who have submitted our lives to Jesus Christ, we're no longer sons of Adam. We are sons of the living God. And so this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. The result of that is, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. In Adam, we became spiritually dead. God said, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you will die. The devil said, you surely will not die. It looked like they didn't die, but spiritually they did die. And it was just a matter of time till they physically died. But Jesus reversed the curse. 
Come on, somebody, Jesus reversed the curse. And so God said to Eve that, that her seed, specifically referring to Jesus, would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. The serpent represents Satan in his demonic realm, and Jesus has gotten us the victory. This is what it says in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Look, it doesn't fix everything, though, does it? We, we still live in a broken world, but it gives us hope. Let me say this, though. This is important. God never cursed Adam and Eve. I don't know if you caught that. He did not curse Adam and Eve. He cursed the serpent. He cursed the ground. There are horrendous consequences in our lives as a result of the fall, but he never cursed man. It's never been in his heart to curse man. He blesses man. That's what God wants to do. What you need to know is Jesus undid everything Adam did. And he did everything Adam failed to do. He undid everything Adam did, and he did everything Adam failed to do. But again, that doesn't fix everything. Truth is, in some ways, life is even harder for believers than it is for non-believers. This is what it says even all back in the Old Testament, Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So many are the afflictions, but God delivers us out of them all. But come on, sometimes deliverance doesn't mean pulling us out of our situation. But that's what we want. See, in the book of Hebrews, it says that, that, that hope in God serves as an anchor to our soul. That sounds nice, doesn't it? I don't like that verse. I don't. You know what an anchor does? An anchor holds something still when a storm comes. And it makes it to where it can withstand it. I don't want an anchor. I want a helicopter. Right? I want a ladder falling down so I can get out of Dodge. That's what we want. But the problem is today we're preaching this helicopter Jesus type of gospel, and it's not the way that it is. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God will eventually deliver them from them all. Listen, maybe it's not supposed to be our best life now, but our best life later. And our perspective is so important. You know, I, I, I've told you, if you go to this church, you know, last year I went on the epic manhood journey with my son and son-in-law, and we hiked the Grand Canyon rim to rim. And so we went down 14 miles to the bottom. Actually, it's about 10 miles to the bottom. I mean, you go four miles across, over a mile down, and we stayed at a camp, and in the morning we got up about a half mile before you start going up, and you go straight up all day, and so for 10 miles. And so, really, honestly, going down was kind of easy. And so we took it easy at the bottom of the camp and laid in the water and really thought, I, I, we got this. In the morning, it's not going to be a problem. And so we started off, and the incline starts very, very slowly. And so we were about halfway there, and we had only climbed a little bit. In fact, we had three-quarters of a mile still to go by the time we were halfway. In other words, the grade was just sloping gently. It was great. And we took a break halfway, and then we got up, and I realized, wow, all of a sudden, we're starting to go up at a higher angle, and it got hard. And so we got to a point about two miles before from the top, and what happened was we had a, a male guide with us, and we had a female guide with us, and I had hung with Dakota and Nate the whole way, but like it got caught up to the old man, and I wasn't in very good shape, and so I just started to struggle, you know. And so they went ahead, and, and, and the girl stayed back with me, and she's just trying to encourage me, and I'm just like, every step is just like, man, this is, this is getting rough, you know? And so we took a break, and she says, look, we got to get up. We got to get going. I said, no, I need, I need a longer break. <laughs> she's like, look, Barry, your legs are going to start cramping and locking up. You can't take a break. You got to get out of here. And so I, all right, let's go on the switchback start. And the switchbacks are just up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, the problem is you can't see the top, okay? It looks like you should be able to look up and see the rim, but you can't because there's always a higher mountain blocking it. So you just keep going. And every time you think that that summit you were looking at was the top, you realize, no, now you can see up further, but you still can't see the top. And it's frustrating. And so we start doing the switchbacks, and they're tough. And she says, look, we need to do uh, some more switchbacks. And we're going, we're going, we're going. And so we get to the point where I'm like, look, I, I can't take another step. I need to stop. And so I sit on a rock, and she gives me five minutes. And she's like, Barry, we got to go. And I said, I, I, I can't go on. She says, look, there's two more switchbacks. See the one that comes back? It goes this way, comes back. See that? I said, yeah. She said, get to that point, and it'll get easier. 
And so I just, everything I had, two more switchbacks, I can do that. And I got up to the second switchback and I looked up and as I'm sitting down, I realized the next one's even steeper. And I'm ticked. <laughs> and I'm like, you said easier, what's up with that? And she said, Barry, look up. And as I looked up, I realized I can see the rim, see the people up on the rim. She's like, that's the end goal. It's going to get harder, but that's the end goal. Keep your eyes on the rim and we'll get out of here. So yes, I can do it. And we're going, we're going. <laughs> and it'd get hard and I'd look down and tell her I needed a break. And she said, lift your head. And I'd lift my head and I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And we got up near the top, and our goal was we were going to get out in four hours. This guy had taken 80-some groups, and nobody's ever beaten five hours. We can't be satisfied beating five. got to do four. And so we, because we're just guys, and that's how we think. And so what I found was as I get to the top, and I'm just barely almost crawling, Nate and Dakota actually waited for me so we can all go across the line. If they hadn't, they would have broke four hours. As it stood, we got over that in four hours and nine minutes, and the party was on, baby, and we found ice cream, and it was all good. <laughs> Until I started cramping up, but that's another story. <laughs> but my point is, as we go through this life, look, we got a choice. We can, we can look at what's going on around us, and we can bump, become discouraged, right? And we can just focus on our pain and our struggles and our difficulties. And man, I'm telling you what, if we do, this life becomes miserable. And we lose our peace and we lose our joy. But if we'll look up and we'll keep our focus on Jesus, the Lord of lords and King of kings, then guess what? You're stronger than what you think you are. You can make it further than you think you can go. We've got to look up, church, and when we do, it makes all of the difference in the world. When we're looking down and the stock market crashes, guess what? We begin to panic. But when we're looking up, we realize that our real treasure is in heaven anyway. Come on, when we're looking down and we get the diagnosis, all of a sudden it's devastating. But when we're looking up, we look forward to that new body that's incorruptible, that will last forever. Come on, when we're looking down and our prayers aren't being answered in what we consider an expedient amount of time, we get discouraged and it affects our faith. But when we're looking up, our faith is strengthened as we realize that God has us and he will see us through. I want to tell you, it makes all the difference in the world. Someone once said, be careful how you interpret the world. It's like that. And so when we're fixating on our imperfect world, it's just the quickest, surest way to lose your joy. We have to look above that. Joyce Meyer once said, the worst thing in the world is to not be saved. The second worst thing is to be saved and to not enjoy it. Right? And so we cannot afford to lose our joy. If we choose to find the awful in every situation, listen, we are going to live cursed lives, but it's not a curse from God. It's a curse that we put upon ourselves. Be careful how you interpret the world. It's like that. I, I started the year with a 21 day fast, and I felt like the Lord was telling me to fast social media, the news, and so forth. And after 21 days, I just realized, man, my attitude was better, so I'm just going to keep this thing going, right? I was talking to somebody yesterday. He says, man, can you believe that measles outbreak? Now, I'm not going to lie. I was a little embarrassed that I hadn't even heard about it, but I hadn't heard about it, right? Apparently in California, 700 people quarantined. This is a really big deal. Okay, but I live in Illinois, and how is knowing that making my life better? If it breaks out in Rantoul, someone's going to tell me, Right? <laughs> And I'm just saying there's a balance between, you know, being irresponsible and uninformed, but I'm just telling you negative news sells. Positive news doesn't sell. And so we got to be careful what we allow in. We start focusing on the negative. Adam and Eve focused, could have focused on the thousands of trees that they were allowed to eat from and said they fixated on the one they couldn't. Come on, this is when we get in trouble. And as Americans, I just want to tell you it's tough. It's tough. Now, let me just start. I, I am proud to be an American. I, I served in the military. I am proud of our nation. I think of Paul. Paul went and, and they beat him. The Romans did, and he was a Roman citizen. So they were just going to let him go away quietly. He said, oh, no, you don't. I'm a Roman citizen. I want someone here to account for this. And the guy comes up. He says, he says, Paul, you know, I paid a great amount of money for my citizenship. But Paul said, yeah, but I was born here. 
right? That's how I look in America. I was born here. This, this, is, this is my nation. This is the greatest nation in the history of the world. Okay, but part of the problem with that is because we follow Judeo-Christian values, and don't get me wrong, we got serious problems today. I've been clear about that. But because we follow this principle, we, we become prosperous. And affluence is the problem. When, when you're wealthy, what happens is you take things for granted. You may say, I'm not wealthy. If you live in the United States of America, you're wealthy. The poorest of us are in the top 10% worldwide wealth, and most of us are in the top 1% just by making an average income puts you in the 1% worldwide of wage earners. But the problem is affluence. And so, I don't know if you've ever flown internationally, when you land in a third world country, something really strange happens. And in Israel, I noticed it happens too. Something we don't do. If you fly from, you know, Chicago to New York, you land, you get off the plane, that's the end of it. But when you land in, in Mexico or Kenya or, or like I said, in Israel or India, what happens is they erupt in applause when the plane hits the ground. And at first I was like, did they think we weren't going to make it? <laughs> that's not it. They didn't take it for granted. They knew that there was a possibility we wouldn't make it. They weren't worried about it. But when we did land, then it was reason for celebration. But the Americans, we take it for granted. Right? What if we started celebrating little things like that? What, what a difference that can make. Man, I always enjoy preaching our Thanksgiving message once a year. And look, I don't know if you get anything out of it, but I preach myself happy every time I preach that message. <laughs> Right, because all week I'm focusing on counting my blessings and what I'm grateful for. And I'm, can I just tell you, that makes a difference in, in your life when you start living that way. Counting your blessings counters the, and it really is the antidote for an ungrateful heart. See, the problem with discouragement is it never leads to encouragement. It leads to more discouragement. And then we get depressed about the fact that we're depressed. We get sad because we're sad. And it's just this self-perpetuating cycle that never seems to get better. And so a couple weeks ago, I chipped my favorite coffee mug. I, th this is just, I mean, it's an eight-bug mug, okay? But this is like, this is my favorite mug. And the chip's by the handle. And so it's up at the top near the handle. It's nowhere near where I drink. It's not that big of a deal, right? Except to me, it's ugly, right? And so like as Americans, when we have something like that, we typically either throw it away or we just deal with it, but we don't nearly find the satisfaction we found in it before. And so this is like, he's on the bench. I don't even use it unless we're out of all other coffee mugs. And it was my favorite. But if I would have had like found the piece of ceramic and maybe was able to glue it just perfectly where I couldn't tell that it was there, I, I could have been happy with it. If I couldn't see it, you couldn't see it. Pastor Eric was sharing with me something in, in Japan. It's called Kintsugi. Kintsugi. By, by the way, by the way, I'm going to detour here real quick. I got into staff meeting last week, and, and my staff went off on me. I, I'm a very serious. And they just started saying, look, Barry, we've been keeping it back, but you can no longer do accents in church. And I'm like, real serious. I'm like, why? And they're like, come on, man. Your Middle Eastern accent sounded Irish. Irish! <laughs> man, I've mastered nearly every dialect, and I, j I don't receive their negativity. <laughs> All right, back to Kintsugi. <laughs> and so what it is is, is when, when a piece of pottery or ceramic breaks, Japanese, they don't throw it away. What they do is they get a little gold uh, string or whatever, and, and they mend it back together with gold. And so what happens is it becomes more valuable than before it was damaged, right? What a different way of looking at things. And so all of a sudden, this thing now that's been broken has honor. Oh, come on, somebody, you're going to get this. You thought the abuse you suffered. Come on, it, it, it made you damaged goods, but you forgot that, that God brings beauty from ashes. Come on, you thought that, you, you thought that, that the divorce you went through devalued you as a person, but you forgot that your value is found in the living God. You thought your addiction disqualified you from ministry, but it's the very thing that you fell into that God wants to use to bless somebody else. 
This is how it works in the kingdom. And we got to begin to realize this. God never intended us for us to hide our weaknesses. You know, in March of 09, you'd actually have to go back, I guess, to October of 08. Pastor John asked me to preach, and he gave me like six, seven months to prepare. And I thought, okay, I could do it six or seven months. And so we're like a month away, and I realize I don't know how to preach. Like I've done things on the mission field, but that's more like sharing your testimony. And I'm like, God, I didn't go to seminary. That's why I say crazy stuff up here all the time. I don't know the rules. Even fig leaves and crazy stuff. I just, I don't know what to do. And so I, I just like, God, I don't know how to preach. And I just, I, I, I just felt like the Lord was showing me, look, just, just share about what I've done in your life. And so that first Sunday, what I did was I just opened up the Bible and I began to look at a very flawed people in the Bible. And so I looked at the disciples and man, how messed up they were and really jockeying for power and just how, how flawed they were, right? And then I talked about what God had done in my life and then I just spontaneously said, we need to have an altar call. It wasn't for people to accept Christ. It was just, I called, hey, if you want to come down for prayer, come on down. And like there was hardly an empty seat and I'm just praying over people and it was powerful and people are crying and I left, man, I'm telling you, I, I just can't tell you the elation being able to minister like that. And then I went to bed that night, and a little voice started yapping. I don't even know what I'm talking about. A little voice starts yapping. And the enemy started saying, you know what? You can never take that back. Man, you talked about your marriage and how bad of a husband you were. You talked about financial bankruptcy. You've talked about your addiction. You had credibility with people before, but you lost all that now. And for like the next week, man, I couldn't sleep. What I needed was social media, but it was before social media, <laughs> right? Or at least it was before social media for me. But I could have got a pulse of what people thought, but I don't know. And so I come in here the next Sunday, and I'm kind of hanging my head, and I'm like, everyone's gonna, just going to think I'm just like a basket case, because pretty much I am. And, <laughs> and I came in, and someone was like, hey, I just want you to know, Barry, that, that really ministered to me in a deep way. I was like, okay. And, 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 and a lady came up, and she said, Barry, Man, that was just powerful. It was right where I'm at. I needed that word so bad. But the third one is what sealed the deal for me. This guy said to me, he said, you know what? He said, I've been struggling with hidden sin. And he said, and he told me it was pornography. He said, I've been dealing with this for years. I try harder, I try harder, and the noose just gets tighter on my neck. He said, but you got up and talked about how you got problems in front of the whole church. So what I decided was he had life group that very Sunday night that I preached. He said, I can at least, in, in a small group of friends who love me, I can trust them enough to say, I need help, I need prayer. And he said that he confessed it to the group, and when it happened, it lost its power. And he felt like he was free. <laughs> Come on, sin is the only thing that grows in darkness. Right, and when we expose these things to the light... They lose their power. God wants your testimony. He wants your story. We got to quit hiding behind this act that we're perfect. People already know we're not. Nobody of our first time guests came in here and thought we had it all together. They were thinking, gosh, these guys are messed up. But hopefully they saw that we love Jesus and that we're trying to love on them. That's good enough, right? I was reading from Hebrews, the called the, the Hall of Faith, right? It's what we kind of refer to it as. So these are like greatest men and women in the Bible. And so it starts with Moses and you're reading about Moses and what he did and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It goes on to David and Samson and all of these heroes of the faith, right? One of the things I really love is it's just like God and his mercy and his grace to include Rahab the harlot. Only God would put a prostitute in the, in the Hall of Faith. But it gets down to verse uh, Hebrews 11:34, because we all know that these people are all flawed. Everyone I just said, right? And it says, God took their weakness and he turned it to strength. Oh, come on, that's what God wants to do. He wants to take our weakness and he wants to make it a strength. There's three, times of, three types of people in this world, as far as I see, and that, that's all I can come up with. There's perfect people. You say, Pastor, there's no perfect people. I know, but nobody told them. <laughs> and so there's people, and they think they got it all together. 
And when something goes wrong, it can't be their fault. When their kid messes up, it's got to be the teacher's fault. It can't be their kid's fault. And so they defend everything. They take no responsibility, and they go through life thinking they're perfect when they are flawed in just unimaginable ways. And then there's imperfect people. And the problem with the imperfect people is they fixate on their imperfection. In other words, they just see themselves as a loser. And my granddaddy was messed up, and my dad was messed up, and I'm messed up. This is just the way that it is. And they don't really get all that far in life neither, but then there's perfectly imperfect people. You know what perfectly imperfect people are? They realize that they're flawed and they're damaged, but in their father's eyes, they are perfect. That he sees them through the blood of Jesus and he loves them just as they are. He has a plan and a purpose for their life despite anything that they may think or believe about themselves. I wonder if you would stand with me as we prepare to close the service. I want to pray for you. You know, I'm going to ask you to do something for me as you stand. Would you just grab the hand of the person next to you? If you're visiting with us, I understand this might be a little uncomfortable. In fact, kind of in the ministry, they tell us don't do this because it makes people uncomfortable. But what you need to know is the Bible talks about the laying on of hands of believers, and sometimes power is transferred right? Sometimes healing is transferred just by holding someone's hand. I believe that encouragement is transferred just by holding someone's hand. And right now I'm believing God's going to release that into your life. Some of you, you're going through some difficult things. And the problem is you're looking down instead of looking up. And so you come in on Sunday morning and man, it's great here when we're sitting with our brothers and sisters, but you know, you got to leave that door and you know what's waiting. And Monday morning, you got to go back to a job you don't like and deal with situations you don't like and maybe face that diagnosis, face the prospects of divorce. And right now, I just want God to encourage you right where you're at. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in Jesus' name, God, I pray that we leave here stronger than we came. God, it would be kintsugir, however you say it, God, that you would make us stronger in those things that we've tried to hide, those things that we thought were dishonorable. You would show us how you've redeemed them and how they can encourage other people. Let us be bold and brave and brazen as we go out into the world and we minister and we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just how good he is, but what he has done in our lives. And we're real and transparent in God as we do, as we do, Father you will begin to change things in our lives and change those around us for your glory. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have any questions or want more information, just check out our website at www.christian.life.